Welcome to If You Love This Planet. My special guest today is Arjun Makajani, President of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Tacoma Park, Maryland, in the United States. Arjun holds a PhD in engineering and has produced many studies and articles on nuclear fuel cycle related issues, including weapons production, testing and nuclear waste over the past 20 years. He's the principal author of the first study ever done, completed in 1971, on energy conservation potential in the United States economy. Most recently, Dr. Makajani has authored Carbon Free and Nuclear Free, a roadmap for US energy policy, published by RDR Books and IEER Press in 2007. The book is the first analysis of a transition to a US economy based completely on renewable energy without any use of fossil fuels or nuclear power. Arjun Makajani, a very warm welcome to If You Love This Planet. Thank you, Helen. We should say that you and David Freeman inspired this book, Carbon Free and Nuclear Free. <laughs> David Freeman being uh, the former Jimmy Carter's science advisor. Brilliant man. Uh, Jimmy Carter is uh, chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and I was going to... Are you, are you, are you a new, uh, an engineer? I thought you were a nuclear physicist, Arjun. No, no, nuclear... Uh, you can describe me as a plasma physicist, a uh, nuclear physicist, engineer yes. or electrical engineer, but not a nuclear physicist. That's a slightly different animal. Okay, so I always do describe you as a plasma physicist, not quite knowing <laughs> okay. what that means, but it sounds very good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, it's Arjun, not the blood plasma in medicine. <laughs> no, it's not the, not the blood plasma <laughs> minus the red blood cells. Um, so... Today we're going to concentrate on thorium. I have had a lot of dealings lately with people who are very keen about thorium. There's a big push amongst a certain group of nuclear scientists, engineers, physicists who are really quite addicted to the notion of thorium reactors. So I think we start should start right at the beginning. What is thorium? How much of it is there in the world? Where is it located? And we'll go from there. Okay, thorium is a uh, naturally occurring heavy metal. Uh, there are actually different kinds of thorium. We're talking about one particular kind, uh, thorium-232. Um, it is not a nuclear fuel, uh, but you can make a nuclear fuel out of it. You if mean you stick it, it's it in not a reactor. fissionable? It doesn't fission? Yeah, it, yeah, it's not fissile, so it won't sustain a chain reaction. Right. There's only one material that occurs in nature that can sustain a chain reaction um, that occurs in nature in any any significant quantity. He uh, got very, very excited about nuclear energy, uh, not because of uranium-235, but because of uranium-238, of which we have lots and lots and lots, uh, which is the main constituent of depleted uranium, and we have half a million tons of depleted uranium in this country, and you could run a thousand reactors for 500 years. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, so it's a lot. Uh, thorium-232 is similar. You can turn it into uranium-233 in a reactor. But the difference is that there's no um, component of thorium that can sustain a chain reaction. So you need something else to run the reactor so that you can turn thorium into uh, uranium-233, which can sustain a chain reaction. And so that's where these two paths separate. And one of the reasons people advocate thorium uh, reactors uh, is that there's more thorium than uranium in the world. But if you're going to make breeder reactors where you're turning non-fuel material like thorium or uranium-238 into fuel, there's actually no shortage of the material. There's... Um, uh, in my, in some countries have a lot of thorium. India being a primary example, they have very, very little uranium, low grade mostly, lots and lots of thorium. So they would like to see thorium reactors. So that's a sort of a parochial or regional reason. But overall, I I see very little merit in the argument that there's a lot more thorium, so we should do thorium reactors because there's plenty of uranium and uranium is pretty cheap and 
is going to probably remain pretty cheap. What are the downsides of thorium reactors? And, and so therefore you need to walk us through the fuel cycle of thorium so people really understand what the downsides of thorium are. Well, the pluses and minuses with every, you know, overall, as you know, Helen, I don't support the use of fissile materials uh, to make electricity. You know, making uh, materials with which you can make nuclear bombs and which create long-lived um, uh, fission products uh, like technesium-99 and iodine-129 uh, doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, so, with it, but within that context, every particular reactor concept has its pluses and minuses. Mm. Now, thorium is not associated with any particular reactor concept. You can use thorium in lots of different reactors. You, uh, thorium can be used in the present reactors that we have, uh, and has been used in the present kind of reactors. It's just a more difficult material and it hasn't kind of worked out that it is particularly more interesting or economical in some way. Um, the Indians are interested in it. They have an experimental heavy water reactor in which they use solid thorium uh, pellets. That's what has happened mostly with thorium, is they've tried to mimic the fuel uh, in existing reactors, which is uranium fuel, about recently is what Alan Weinberg thought might work very well uh, is a particular kind of thorium reactor, which is called the liquid uh, fuel thorium reactor or lifter, LFTR. That's the thing I think that people get most excited about. And if you want, I can explain what that is. Yes, please. I do want. So a small apart from a very small sort of rocket or uh, Air Force uh, machine that was built uh, in the 1950s, which operated for a few months, there's been really only one reactor of this type that has been built uh, that operated at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee for a few years in the 1960s. I think it went critical in 1964 and stopped in 1969 or 1970. Uh, it was a small machine, 8 megawatts thermal, and just for reference, uh, a power reactor, a typical power reactor is 3,000 megawatts thermal. And it never generated any electricity. It was an experimental machine to see how the reactor itself would work. And they just dissipated the heat in a heat exchanger. So the way this reactor works is, first of all, because thorium is not a fuel, you have to have a fissile material like plutonium or enriched uranium to get the chain reaction going. And the fuel is in a liquid form. It's a molten salt. And the molten salt is a fluoride. So you have uh, uranium tetrafluoride. You have uh, plutonium in fluoride form. I think it's, plutonium is not a tetrafluoride, but I'm not maybe remembering that correctly. Uh, do you have thorium tetrafluoride, so you have all of these things that have a fairly high melting point, and you run this reactor at very high temperatures, uh, much higher, than, about double the temperatures of, of present reactors. And the advantage that is one of the advantages that is uh, mentioned for this, which is a, which is a, which is quite correct, and I agree with it, is that you operate the reactor at uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, so it doesn't need a pre high pressure vessel like a pressurized water reactor or a boiling water reactor. The other advantage is that because you have a molten salt fuel, um, you won't have a meltdown. Well, that's a less of a an appealing argument because your your fission products are already in a, in in the molten salt. And so the volatile fission products are going to evaporate, and then you have to make sure to trap them so they don't escape to the atmosphere. But uh, And then you take this molten salt, and you have a heat exchanger in which you have another circuit of molten salt, and then you can either make steam or um, very hot gases, and then you run a turbine and generate electricity, and some people hope that because you have very, very high temperatures, you can also make hydrogen from water and uh, have a hydrogen economy. It's very far off. One of the problems with this kind of machine 
is that the materials requirements are very tough. So you run at very high temperatures, and uh, the cost and durability of these materials over long periods of time needs to be tested. Uh, so it will take a long time to actually check everything out. How will these heat exchangers work? That's been one of the problems with sodium-cooled breeder reactors. It's not been in the reactor itself. The reactor concept actually has some merits on its own, but it's the sodium circuits that have given lots of problems in some reactors. And in Japan, the Monju reactor leaked some sodium. And, of course, sodium catches fire. And so it was shut down not long after it was commissioned, and it is still shut down 17, 16, 17 years later. Well, one of the touted advantages of the molten salt reactor is unlike the molten salt sodium, it won't catch fire in contact with air, which is also true. And finally, the, the, the another advantage touted is that if you have a problem, there are cement uh, sort of cells or chambers under the reactor, and a plug will melt, and the reactor will be drained, and and you will have uh, you will have all of this fuel in in these cells so that you won't have, you know, a very large inventory of radioactive materials in the reactor that, that could escape. So so the reactor, so people get excited for fairly rational reasons if you accept the framework for nuclear energy. But unfortunately, as in the previous excitements of nuclear energy, people get so excited that they don't look at the downsides. So they say, for instance, that there's not a proliferation issue with thorium reactors. You mean you which can't is actually, build bombs from the fuel? Yeah, which is actually somewhat backwards from my assessment, uh, and not only my assessment. So here's the argument that is put forward. Uh, thorium-232, as I told you, you can't run a reactor with thorium-232. You have to have fissionable. either plutonium or enriched uranium because it's not fissile. Mm -hmm. So you have all of the disadvantages of the other. So you, now you have to have a uranium enrichment plant or you have a reprocessing plant to separate plutonium. Uh, they say, you know, we can burn up the existing waste from reactors. Well, you can't do that unless you have a reprocessing plant and you separate the plutonium. Of course, once you separate the plutonium, you've got bomb-grade material, bomb-usable exactly. bomb material, exactly. and all of the proliferation headaches that go with it. This reactor in Oak Ridge operated on uh, medium-enriched uranium, 33%, if I remember correctly, which is um, eight, ten times the enrichment of the of the present reactors. It operated on plutonium, and it operated on uranium-233. It actually never operated on thorium, <laughs> and so that experience remains to be accumulated. Then, when you do put thorium for tetrafluoride in the reactor, some of this thorium becomes uranium-233. A very tiny part of the thorium under bombardment of neutrons by a completely different uh, sort of nuclear reaction route also becomes uranium-232. Now you have a mixture of two different kinds of uranium, uranium-233 and uranium-232. 232 has a very short half-life, comparatively, 70 years, and it decays into a thallium-208, if I'm remembering the chain correctly, and and that is an extremely radioactive material. And so the claim is, because now you've got an isotopic mixture of uranium-233 with something that's highly radioactive and gives off extremely strong gamma radiation, so that would be very difficult to build a bomb with it. Oh, but there's a, little, there's a little bit of a problem with this reasoning. In order to operate this reactor, you have to make uranium-233, and you have to separate that uranium-233 from all the fission products. So you've got to be cleaning out this molten salt all the time. There are a number of ways to do it, but basically you need a reprocessing plant right there on site. What do you use? What do you, why do you need to get the uranium-233 out? Well, you need to separate the fuel from the fission products because if you if the fission products accumulate in the reactor, the chain reaction will stop at a certain ah, point. 
Oh, I see. So that's why, you know, there's, there's still fissile material left and spent fuel when it is spent and used up in a reactor. Uh, typically, you, you refuel that reactor because at, at some point, long before the material is all used up, the operation of the uh, chain reaction becomes very inefficient. But then and you get so, the uranium-233 out, and then what do you do? do you, what do you do with the uranium-233? Um, you put it back in the reactor, and that's what sustains the chain reaction. So the idea is you put in these other materials, plutonium and enriched uranium, to start with, and thorium, and then you make uranium-233. Oh, and then you get uh, And then the you won't need any more enriched uranium and oh, plutonium. Then you'll just be operating on thorium, that reactor. But because you actually don't make an excess of uranium-233 in this kind of machine, it's quite hard. Uh, and it's one of the disadvantages of this reactor compared to the sodium-cooled reactor. Uh, the sodium-cooled reactor was chosen in the 70s partly because it, it breeds a lot more excess fuel. So once you've got one of these machines going, it'll not only keep going from uranium-238 on its own, it'll also make fuel that you can use in other reactors. Plutonium, plutonium. Plutonium. And in this particular case, uh, the amount of extra fuel will be minimal. Uranium so basically, yeah. for every new reactor, you're going to need plutonium or enriched uranium. And and at every new at every reactor, you have to have a reprocessing plant to clean yeah, out the fission product yeah. and put the U-233 back in the reactor. Now, if that's all you're doing, uh, you won't have a proliferation problem. But the, the way in which uranium-233 actually is made, the nuclear reactions that occur, have one very, very important difference with the way plutonium is made from uranium-238. The time lapse between uranium-238 absorbing a neutron and becoming plutonium-239 is only a few days. Mm. Uh, and you have an intermediate product called neptunium-239, uh, which has a half which has a fairly short half-life. I think it's a couple of days. Any, anyway, it's a, it's a few-day period. Mm. The time lapse between thorium-232 and uranium-233 is months because the intermediate product, protactinium-233, has a 27-day half-life. Mm. So now, since protactinium is chemically different than uranium or thorium, once you have protactinium being built up in the reactor or in the blanket, you know, in the mm. in surrounding the reactor, you have a blanket of thorium where you make uranium-233. Now you can chemically separate the protactinium-233 as it is being formed, put it in a separate chamber, allow it to decay for a few months, and now you have pure uranium-233 essentially without a uranium-232 contaminant, and you have excellent bomb-grade material. Because you can so make actually, a bomb out of uranium-233. Yes, uranium-233 properties are very close to plutonium-239. Wow. It has a somewhat bigger uh, critical mass, uh, but not much bigger than plutonium. Mm. Uranium-235 has a much bigger critical mass mm. than either of them. And uh, so uranium-233 um, uh, is uh, bomb-grade bomb material, and actually, because protactinium-233 is different than both thorium and uranium and has a fairly long half-life, 27 days, you can actually make fairly um, clean, uh, uncontaminated uranium-233. And make bombs. Um, and, of course, you could make bombs with it. So one of the huge disadvantages of this machine is once you build these reactors, you're going to build a reprocessing plant with every single reactor. Now, the U.S. and nuclear weapon states won't be using uranium-233 or won't be using these kind of machines uh, to get bomb material. The U.S. has already got plenty of surplus bomb materials that it doesn't know what to do with. There's 50 tons of surplus plutonium that they're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And they're spending billions of dollars doing it. And the Russians also have plenty of surplus uh, so do the Japanese. material. 
And, and well, the Japanese have got, <laughs> got you know, what they tons would of call it. commercial plutonium. <laughs> it's, it's formerly in the commercial sector under IAEA safeguards. Yeah. Of course, the Japanese could if they decided to withdraw from the NPT, which they have not said that they're going to do. But they could, in theory, make make uh, bombs very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and there has been a debate from time to time um, uh, on the right side of the Japanese political spectrum whether Japan should become a nuclear weapons yeah. state or not. Yeah. So now, if you use this particular type of machine, see one of the one of the problems with this machine and the integral fast reactor, which is a sodium cooled reactor with a reprocessing plant attached to it, is if you go with on site reprocessing, it becomes your really multiplying the machines of proliferation. Today, proliferation threats are not located in the reactor itself. That's because the reactor itself uses low-enriched uranium, which, and you can't make bombs of that. And the plutonium that's made in the reactor is all mixed up with, with the uranium and fission products, and you can't make bombs with that. So to make the bombs with plutonium, in from present reactors, you have to put it in a chemical processing plant, which is not at the reactor site. In fact, there are just a few in the world. The largest one, as you know, is in France at La Hague in the Normandy Peninsula, not far from those famous beaches. And uh, you separate the plutonium there, and then you can make a f- reactor fuel with that. But these plants are very big. They're very expensive. They're very detectable. They're they're completely separate from from the reactor, and so there are few places in which the proliferation risks are concentrated. They're difficult plants to build. North Korea has a one, and that's where their plutonium from the bomb for their bomb comes from. The other proliferation sort of locus in the present system is the uranium enrichment plants. As you know, there's a tomorrow there's going to be a meeting around the Iranian uranium enrichment efforts, and we have a uranium enrichment plant operating in the United States and Kentucky and one in New Mexico and France has one and so on. There are a number of uranium enrichment plants, but they're not many compared to the number of reactors. Mm. And so today the problem of inspection, the problem of diversion, the problem of making sure of accounting of fissile materials, which is extremely hard even today, is concentrated in just a few places. Less, I would guess it's less than a couple of dozen places. If if you build hundreds and hundreds of these reactors, and the, just the inspection problem will become a nightmare. I'll give you an example. Um, a decade, what, two decades ago, 15 years ago, uh, a discrepancy was found in the plutonium accounting at the Japanese reprocessing plant. And it took years and years and years to figure out what happened to this 200 kilograms. So now we're trying to assess how we are going to control a machine uh, at every reactor that could make bomb-grade material. So that's one of the really big downsides, in my opinion. What is touted as an upside, just from the chemistry of the molten salt reactor, and the nuclear physics of the of the molten salt reactor, the radiochemistry of the molten salt reactor, because of this long half life of protactinium and its separate chemical properties, you actually got, in my opinion, uh, a very very significant proliferation headache that will be bigger than the one we have today. I'm interviewing Dr. Arjun Makajani a plasma physicist who's president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Tacoma Park, Maryland. So (laughs) you have to, Arjun, to go back. We're talking about thorium reactors. So to get out the pure uranium-233 that can be made into bombs without the nasty, nasty uranium-232 that converts to a very high-energy, very dangerous gamma emitter. I can't remember what the name of that substance was. What was it? I believe it is thallium-208. Thallium-208, terribly dangerous. You take out... So to to get the proctotinium out, do you have to reprocess the, the fuel? You have to... 
dissolve it in concentrated nitric acid to get the proctotinium out, then store it and it will turn into pure uranium-233, which then can be used for bombs. Right? Right. Right. I see. So, or that you can you can reprocess um, the spent fuel um, uh, with the uranium-232, which is so dangerous to get out the uranium-233 to be put back into the reactor to produce the, the fissile response in the neutrons to convert more thorium to uranium-233. But, right. but there, you there can still have the very that, dangerous 232 in it if you're not worried about making yourself a bomb. Right. I mean, in, in a normal operation, you would, you would just be circulating the uranium-233 and uranium-232 back into the reactor. Uh-huh. And uh, in that kind of state, if you separate that uranium, it's much more difficult. You can do it. Um, but it's more difficult yeah. uh, because of the radiation danger. Yeah, yeah, terribly. But in principle, you can extract yeah. um, pure plutonium out of this, uh, a pure uranium-233 yeah. or nearly pure uranium-233 out of a molten salt What's reactor. the half-life of uranium-233? The half-life of uranium-233 is about 160,000 years. Yeah, it's... Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, about... Uh, Five times, six times, five, six. They have five times the half life of plutonium, which is 24,000 years. 400 years, yeah. So, uh, you, Arjun Makajani, you've told me that thorium reactors are just economically out of the question. Economically. Well, I wouldn't say they're economic. We don't know the economics of thorium reactors. There's, there's some reason to believe on some counts they would be cheaper. And there's some reason to believe that on some ground they'd be more expensive uh, because you have two molten salt uh, loops, you have very expensive materials, and so on. Uh, you have to have a reprocessing plant with every reactor. Uh, the decommissioning and waste problems with thorium reactors could be very, very much more difficult than with present reactors, Why? which are already quite difficult. Why? Uh, the the machine at Oak Ridge was shut down in 1969 or 70, and uh, the molten salt went into the cement cells at the bottom of the reactor, mm. and the salt also contains beryllium fluoride. So now beryllium under the action of alpha radiation will produce neutrons. So you have accidental criticality risks. Oh. Uh, you have... Um, uh, nuclear waste, that it's in a very difficult form. You, you have to process it to actually put it in a form that can be disposed of in a re- repository. And since between 1970 and 2012, they've been trying to figure out what they're going to do with this stuff. Oh, it's still really? sitting there. Cool. Every, every so, so basically, one of the choices is to convert that part of Oak Ridge National Lab into a place sort of uh, permanent, you know, with a sarcophagus permanently oh, like Chernobyl. Really? And OB- yes. <laughs> the the others are to be able to take this stuff out and process it and condition the way so it could be in a form that could be compatible with deep geologic disposal. Every single estimate of the management of this waste from this reactor that cost less than $10 million to build at the time, which would be, I don't know, $50, $60 million in today's times, in in today's dollars. Every single estimate for decommissioning and disposing off the waste from this reactor, which never generated any electricity, is more than $400 million. Where uh, where does the beryllium (laughs) come from? uh, Well, the beryllium beryllium is put, into uh, into the fuel in this particular design, uh, I presume to to maintain certain properties of the uh, of the liquid fuel. Beryllium, of course, has long been used as a neutron source. You know, the early um, neutron, and even now, I don't know now they use beryllium in neutron sources. They might. Uh, beryllium is used with plutonium two thirty eight and other other alpha emitters. As neutron sources, and I think oh. may even have been used initially in in bombs as the uh, neutron triggers. 
Uh, I, I don't didn't believe know they are that. anymore. Well, well, to turn yeah. beryllium into radioactive beryllium, because beryllium is not normally radioactive, how do you... No, no, I don't think you, you would be turning beryllium into radioactive. Beryllium does have a uh, radioactive isotope. Uh, Na- naturally, but, does uh, it? Uh, beryllium-10, which has quite a long half-life of about uh, one and a half million years. So you have a number of different waste problems in this reactor. So the molten salt reactor also is, has a graphite moderator. Um, Chernobyl had a graphite moderator. Which and, um, and scale had a graphite moderator. Yeah. So uh, you keep a neutral... Um, uh, uh, a noble gas or, or, or uh, 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 non an inert gas in the cover of the reactor, but if you do have a loss of um, uh, loss of coolant or loss of pressure or loss of containment in the reactor, your your fuel will go down into the the cement cells. But if you get air rushing into the reactor vessel in contact with very hot carbon, you could get a fire. Mm-hmm. So. The accident mechanisms of this particular reactor will be very, very different. They have to be studied very carefully. And now, of course, you've got carbon graphite that has become activated. So now you have carbon-14, and you have um, very large blocks of carbon-14 that are radioactive, half-life 5,700 and odd years, carbon-14. And, you know, we have had a few reactors with carbon graphite moderators like the Hanford reactors where the plutonium for the Nagasaki bomb was made. And just the disposal of those graphite blocks has become a giant headache, still not accomplished, um, even though it has been decades since those reactors were shot. So decades since most of those reactors were shot. I think the last one was shot in 1987 or 88. It's a machine with very distinct advantages that uses a more abundant raw material, but it's also a machine with its own very particular distinct disadvantages that will take 20 years, 30 years, 40 years to prove. Just think what it will take to build one of these machines, uh, get the data, prove it, make a license application or certification application for the NRC, which currently has essentially no expertise in these reactors, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, to build up their expertise, evaluate the data, and certify these reactors. It will take decades. And I wouldn't, you know, I'm already not happy with the with the regulatory system we have. I think but to the extent that you do, they do look after safety, and to some extent they do, uh, they're more lax than I would like, uh, but uh, to relax even that standard and say, oh, we've got this wonderful new machine that we're going to prove out uh, would be quite unwise. So I, I particularly, I don't think that thorium reactors are going to solve any particular problem. Uh, I, I don't think it's a very good investment. I, my my judgment is, you know, when I wrote Carbon Free, Nuclear Free, Helen, you were during the course of the production of the research, you were saying, well, so how fast can we get rid of fossil fuels and nuclear <laughs> power? You know, what's the date? And I said, well, I know I don't know whether it'll be fifty years, a hundred years, or what. I haven't finished my research yet. When I finished, you were quite pleased to hear that I I felt we could do it in, with reasonable and economic sense. In, in 40 years. But today, I would say, looking over the last five years since I finished my book, I think things are proceeding much faster mm. than I anticipated. I try to be cautious. So today, if we could get the German organization and sensibility about solar in the United States, U.S. solar cells cost twice as much as Germany. Really? Really? And I'm trying to figure out why. I recently have discovered this. If we could install solar on commercial rooftops or even household rooftops in California or yeah. New York State. All over California, yeah. We, we could produce electricity for residential and small commercial sector that is cheaper than what people are paying today. Yeah. But for some reason, U.S. prices are double what they are in Germany. 
And Germany, of course, costs are higher, not because they're not doing it efficiently, but because it's a very cloudy, rainy place, and they have quite, and it's a northern, northern country, so they, they don't have very good solar energy. But you know, their secret is they're becoming a huge exporter of, That's right. of well, solar technology. Like China. So I, I think all this aside, nuclear energy is in my crystal ball, admittedly cloudy. Are going to be pretty obsolete in ten years. Yes. So thorium machines don't even have a chance of of no. kind of saying, "Okay, here we are. We are your competition." It it doesn't make sense to me. You know what I always say, and people might be offended by this, but it's always been the physicist's wet dream to have thorium reactors. <laughs> I'm breeder, not going to go there. <laughs> and breeder reactors. I mean, that's. <laughs> well, you know it. I'll, 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 I'll take you up on that in a different way. Um, Alan Weinberg wrote a memoir, um, and I do admire him. He was a, he was a very brilliant man and, and quite honest in some ways, and, and the, the nuclear establishment actually got quite upset with him at some point. So he said a couple of very, very interesting things. So in an interview in uh, around the 1980 or so uh, with Daniel Ford, he was reminiscing about how excited they got about uranium and breeder reactors and this fuel that would last for millions of years and solve the problems of humanity, for energy problems of humanity. And in reflecting on that, he said, we got very, very excited about that, uh, somewhat in the same spirit as the Ayatollah is at the moment. Yes. And he was referring to Ayatollah Khomeini, it was yeah. just after the. Yeah. So that was kind of a very interesting yeah. reflection. Very revealing. So a, a, a different one along the same direction, you know, as you're thinking. It was a very emotional gut thing. It wasn't a well thought through thing. No. The other thing he, he said in 1970 something, maybe in 72, uh, was even more dramatic and, and very, very thoughtful, in my opinion. He said, we're going to give you this magical energy source. And by magical energy source, he meant we'll, we'll generate energy and then we'll make f more fuel than we used up in generating energy. Because that's what a breeder reactor does. We're going to give you this magical energy source. Uh, but uh, there's a downside. You know, the longevity that we demand of social institutions and human institutions is longer than anything that we've known. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. And that essentially uh, engineers and physicists are making a Faustian bargain with society. Mm. You know, we, sh we can create a nuclear priesthood to look after all the waste and, and the bomb yeah. material. And uh, you have to trust us that we'll do it right. And um, we'll give you this magical energy source. Yeah. And he was much criticized for that because, because nobody likes a Faustian bargain. I mean, if you read Faust, it didn't come to a very good end. No, and yeah. these engineers are not going to come to a very good end either. And, and, well, you know, I hope that we'll be able to get out of it and find new jobs for well, engineers because Arjun, I have a soft spot for engineers being one, you know. <laughs> uh, we could get into a competition between doctors and engineers as yes, to who saved more that, lives, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interviewing Arjun Makajani, who's a plasma physicist and the president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Now, we've got 15 minutes left, Arjun. I want to get into Fukushima. Please would you give us your latest understanding of what is happening there and your prognostication for the future? I mean, they've still got some problems of, you know, cooling the reactors and the debris. Uh, the biggest sort of threat for the future currently is generally recognized to be the spent fuel pool in reactor number four where there's the most fuel of any reactor that was damaged and the reactor core had been unloaded into the pool not long before the accident in March 2011 uh, the structure has been weakened so people are afraid if there's another earthquake there could be sort of a complete breakdown of that pool and you could have a fire and dispersal of quite a large amount of radioactivity. I mean, the inventory of, of cesium in that is, is, is the total inventory of cesium in that pool, by my calculation, is somewhat more than the inventory of cesium that was released in the atmosphere from all atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. That's amazing. 
Uh, yeah, so it's very, very large. At the same time, you know, uh, I mean, Japan would really, there would be a, a bigger catastrophe in Japan if there were a very large fire in that spent fuel pool. Yes. So I think, I think the main task now, of course, it's impossible to approach that spent fuel pool. It's because it's very hot. But not only very hot, but because of the hydrogen explosion, the cranes that normally handle this stuff remotely have mm. been destroyed. Yeah. And so there's no fuel handling. There's no fuel handling machinery in three of these four reactors. Yeah. So it, it's um, very difficult to see how they're going to. I mean, approaching the spent the spent fuel, uh, it has lethal levels of radioactivity. Yeah. So they, but they do have to act with some dispatch to try to get that fuel out of the pool into some better configuration. They have a common pool at the Fukushima site uh, in which they could put it. Or they, they, I don't think all of that can be put into dry storage yet. Some of it, I think, is still too hot. Um, so they have... A, that, I think, is the biggest problem on the site. Then they've got all this contaminated water, uh, you know, they've got the contaminated ocean. But the larger problem that is looming is how to think about the contaminated zone, the contaminated food, how to think about repopulation, whether to think about resettlement of some of these areas, what about the children and the radiation doses in the schools. It doesn't really help to say that the risks are lower than natural, black, um, you know, than, than natural uh, occurrences of cancer. It doesn't help. It's a lie. Uh, and as you know, I'm very, very sober and careful about these numbers. But I've thought about this in a kind of a new perspective, mm. thinking about the anguish as a parent, you yes. know. And and I thought, okay, I I personally actually would be ready to go to help as a professional matter. You know, if I were in a position to make a significant contribution, you know, I'm 67. Okay. But if I lived there, would I send my children to a contaminated school and 30 years later, one of them got cancer? And the chances are the cancer would not be due to the contamination. But would I ever forgive myself because there's a non-zero chance that it could be due to the contamination? I don't think I could ever forgive myself. I don't think any parent could forgive themselves. And so the dilemma isn't just in the levels of radiation. The dilemma is that you're increasing the risk for your kids. And if, they, if something untoward were to happen, you could never live with yourself. And so knowing that down the road, what do you do? Do you abandon your ancestral homes? Do you abandon your communities? Do you abandon your farms or businesses? Or do you kind of step into this very uncertain, anguished... And of course, you know, people have poo-pooed psychological stresses around nuclear react reactors. I think it's time that our community took these things very seriously mm -hmm. because we know more about stress now. Mm -hmm. Stress is a physical, biological thing. And this thing is producing terrible stresses in the population. Mm -hmm. makes us vulnerable to all kinds of diseases. Goodness, we don't sleep well for a few days. We get become more vulnerable to a cold. The problems, the direct and indirect social, economic, and political costs of Fukushima are going to be huge. And the only way I think we can actually learn some lessons, starting with Japan, and I recently wrote an op-ed in Japan, which was published a few days ago in English and in Japanese, uh, about you know, really making the bold de decision to keep all those reactors closed. Yeah. Japan is currently doing without those 54 reactors, yeah. and they have to think, are we going to kind of do air conditioning, or are we going to Switch. and do, you know, contaminated schools, or yeah. are we going to find some other way? If they did what Germany did in December 2011, install three gigawatts of solar PV, if they did that in every month, you know, by next summer they'd be not... Mm. It, they'd still have a deficit, but they wouldn't be hurting mm. very badly. The I wrote the op-ed on a very important nuclear date, which very few people know. And um, it May 5th, 1943, when Japanese forces were first targeted with a bomb. And by some cosmic coincidence, all the reactors in Japan 
were closed. The last one was shot on May 5th, 2012, Fancy that. Fancy that. which caused uh, a reflection on my part yes. that maybe they should turn this tragic date from 43 into a sort of a new beginning in yes. 2012. Yes. So, Arjun Makijani, you're an engineer. How would right. you, and say you were the boss and you had endless amounts of money and access to the world's best engineers, builders and the like, what would you do with building four now and the spent fuel pool number four? What would you do? Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a shoot from the hip engineer. Um, I, I do think the task is very clear. Um, you know, they have to figure out some remote, you know, obviously some mobile crane that will be able to grasp this fuel. The, the question is, you know, they have to have a container up there, too, so they can move it underwater. And then they have to figure out how they're going to transfer it, oh boy. presumably, to this common pool that they have on site. At least some of that fuel will be, have to transfer, be transferred into a pool because it's too hot for dry storage. But I, I'm pretty sure that they know that, that these are the kind of steps that are involved. But, you know, not having studied the details mm. uh, more carefully, I, I wouldn't want to be advising advising people. But I, I, I think, you know, the Japanese have lots and lots of excellent engineers, and I think they should be bringing some of their very, very best talent urgently to bear on this problem. Whether they are or not is a different question. And during the discussion, you talked about the graphite moderating rods that were also in Chernobyl, and they burnt, and that was the f fire that burnt ferociously for 10 days, lofting huge right. amounts of I isotopes right. in the air. But I hadn't thought about that before, but of course the graphite rods were full of carbon-14 as well, weren't they? Yeah, they weren't graphite rods. It's a big graphite block with oh, holes block. in it for the fuel yeah. and the coolant. And one of the advantages of the thorium reactor is, unlike Chernobyl, where the fuel was inside, you know, and remained inside the reactor when the fire was going, and so the the intensely hot fire was dispersed radioactive materials quite high into the atmosphere yes. and then it wound up all over the world. In this particular reactor, the reactor itself would would be empty of the molten salt. Uh, and so the the consequences of, of fire would be would be orders of magnitude less than yes. Chernobyl. I yes. mean they would be serious but, but they would you, they, but they you would brought be up the carbon fourteen yourself. And, yes, I did. And its yes. half life is again what is it carbon fourteen? Half life. Carbon fourteen is five thousand seven hundred and odd. Yes, years. so, so you it's very long. Multiply that by ten, you know. And carbon, of course, is ubiquitous in the biological cycle. Um, right. And the big problem with carbon is that it gets into plants. It'll get into your DNA. Humans. It'll get into your babies. You know, exactly. irradiate in your utero, and it stays around. So the same carbon fourteen will irradiate people. For untold for generations, the rest of time. for fifty thousand years. Is it a beta and gamma, or just beta? It is a beta emitter. Yeah. I don't believe it has a. No, I don't think it does. But be component. beta emitters are pretty nasty because they most of the energy. As an external emitter, it would be pretty nasty. Yeah, well, um, therefore, as an it's, external emitter, not so. Much. No, no, of course, but we're only talking about internal emitters now, and you know, it's almost certainly all over Europe and when I talk about Europe and you know 40% is contaminated with cesium-137 Arjun right, um, right, I is. forget about carbon-14 or yeah actually you know, carbon-14 has no gamma radiation no it doesn't with, you've just looked it up data. haven't you yes <laughs> yeah I have looked it up I have my peri uh, nuclear periodic table open for this conversation <laughs> <laughs> There's another question I've got too, which is the beryllium. I want to get back. Beryllium is not normally radioactive, so when you put no, it in no. a reactor to be used as a sort of construction material for the reactor, it, that's when it becomes radioactive and becomes a neutron emitter, right? No, no, no. Normal beryllium, uh, beryllium doesn't emit neutrons. Neutrons. Uh, oh, even when beryllium absorbs neutrons, it'll become beryllium-10, which is a beta emitter, like oh. carbon-14. I thought you beryllium, said it emits... Normal beryllium yeah. will emit a neutron when it is bombarded by an alpha particle. Oh. So the way they made neutron generators initially 
was with polonium and beryllium. So polonium has a half-life of 82 days or something. So it's a very intense alpha emitter. Right. And when the alpha particles bombard the nucleus of the beryllium, uh, uh, oh. then uh, the energy from the alpha particle uh, dislodges a neutron from the beryllium nucleus. And, and so essentially you get a neutron generator when you combine an alpha emitter with normal non-radioactive beryllium. Well, why do they put beryllium in a thorium reactor in the first place? You know, I have to, in order to give you a good answer, I have to do a little more. You have to look it up. Uh, I, I suspect it has something to do with the neutron economy of the reactor, but I, I am oh. not 100% sure. Okay. The other thing is, as you talk, polonium, of course, is that nasty stuff that killed Litvinenko, that Russian man who was taking tea in Claridge's in the hotel in London and <laughs> yeah. someone dropped yeah. a little tiny bit of polonium in his yeah. tea and he died within, a, I don't know, 10 days of it's acute radiation. It's extremely illness. dangerous material because it has a very short half-life and as a rule of thumb, the shorter the half-life, the, more, the more radioactive a given quantity is. So 82 days, you know, it's, um, what, less than a fourth of a year and plutonium is 24,000 yeah. years, so you can see it's a hundred and odd thousand it's times. A, it's a great It's about a hundred thousand times more radioactive than plutonium. And almost certainly uh, the, the right. plutonium tends to deposit at the bifurcations of the air passages where there is more turbulence as the air is sort of tur uh, going down into the bronchi, and it tends to deposit in the mucosa at the bifurcations, and that is very strongly uh, thought to be a cause of lung cancer from smoking. In fact, that may be right. the main ingredient that induces um, lung cancer from smoking. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, polonium and beryllium are, are uh, unhappy combination because That's... beryllium is actually pretty toxic also. The other interesting thing is, is thorium a daughter or part of the decay chain of uranium or is it a different? That's a different thorium. The decay chain of uranium-238 contains thorium-230. Uh, the material that we've been talking about for reactors is thorium-232, which, like uranium, is a primordial uh, material. That is, uh, the Earth came with it. Oh, and, and so it has its own decay chain, the thorium It has its own decay chain. Two. I must exactly. look that up today and see what it decays into. Right. Because you Well, it decays and it has a radium component and another thorium component. Yeah. And it has its own radon and radon decay products. Right, right. Uh, so uranium, as you know, decays into thorium and radium and radon, and then polonium is a decay product of That's radon. Right. So there's a... There's a Similar decay chain with thorium 232. Well, Arjun, thank you so much. I now understand thorium reactors much better. And when I'm about to debate with some really nasty pro nuclear people in Adelaide shortly in South Australia, and they're all keen about thorium, I know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're probably thoughtful people thinking thinking that they have a good answer to our problem. But, I, you know, in my view and yours, uh, uh, not right, but not necessarily nasty. At least that well, nasty. Right. I debated this guy, Richard Martin, yeah. uh, on Science Friday, and he was a very reasonable... Well, I say panel, nasty you know, because I'm a doctor and I don't like people dying of cancer. <laughs> and any, anyone that propagates cancer for me is a nasty person, I have to say. All right, Helen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, lovey. Thanks so much, Thank you. Arjun. Thank and, you. And, great to talk to you. Yeah, great to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My guest today was Dr. Arjun Makajani, President of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research in Washington, D.C. His website is IEER. Dot org, And if you go to that website, you can download Carbon Free Nuclear Free, which is the roadmap for survival in a nuclear and carbon age. Um, we can prevent global warming and we can shut down all the reactors by probably 2030 now using the principles that Arjun enunciated in Carbon Free Nuclear Free. Thanks so much for listening uh, today. And we'll be back with you again with another absolutely fascinating program next week. Bye for now.